8 of the Ubuntu podcast. In this episode, we're going to be discussing this show. Uh, we'll also have some combined command line love. No, we won't. It's just command line love. Uh, and we'll go over your feedback. I'm Alan, and joining me this week is the gang, Laura. Hiya! Mark. Mark. Hello. Hello. <laughs> and <laughs> Hello, I'm here. Can you hear me? We can now, you are yes. Now. Uh, and Martin, hello. Is that your impression of me? <laughs> 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 I didn't have much time to practice. I'm here too. Hello. <laughs> Hello, Hiya. Martin. Hello. How are you? Yeah, I'm fine, thanks. How's everyone else? So what have you been up to, Martin? <laughs> uh well, I'd love I'd love to say that I've developed some cool new feature for Ubuntu Mate or something like that, but actually I have spent... Say that, nobody would know. Yeah, well I could say that. Yeah, I've done that. I've I've made this epic new feature that's gonna debut in 1510. Or Awesome. I've actually spent all of my spare time watching Daredevil on Netflix. That's really what I've been doing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> awesome. Uh, I don't, what is I don't blame you. It's pretty good. Daredevil. Are you actually asking that seriously, or are you just making so conversation? Enough, no, oh. no, <laughs> no, no. So, so no. it's an original, an original TV series from Netflix, and it's um, uh, a Netflix TV series <laughs> uh, adaptation of the Daredevil comics, and it's very, very good. It's very, very true to the original comics. If you're a comic nerd, this is about as good as it gets it's absolutely fantastic and it sort of blends the best bits from uh, the inception of the character from the 1960s to sort of the real dark anti-hero portrayal from from the 1980s in the comic book so um, if you if you like um, comic books it's it's a really great series Um, uh, not not for your children this is totally for um, an adult audience because it's it's full of um, violence and gore but it's 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 really great and i'd have to say it's probably worth a year's worth of netflix subscriptions just for this one series it's terrific awesome just to add to that i don't re- i'm not really into comic books that much and i still think it's brilliant so yeah. okay hello mark what have you been up to <laughs> uh i've been playing pillars of eternity is that a game you got off of gog no oh. it's a, it it sounds like a game i might have got off of gog it's actually a game i got off of uh steam mm. um it's a uh, it was a Kickstarter game which is um based on the same kind of engine which uh, Baldur's Gate was built with so it's a, a Dungeons Dragons style isom- isometric um RPG game um but it was released um on Linux um along with the other gaming platforms that are available um and it's really cool I've been really enjoying it uh, there's some really nice of sort of uh, pillars of eternity yes hmm. And it's got some really nice sort of, uh, as well as being the the sort of explorey character driven RPG that Baldur's Gate was. It's also got some really nice sort of tactical elements to the gameplay, which I really enjoy. Nice, yeah. And Laura, what have you been up to? More park runs. Well, when you say more park runs, it's really park runs because we deleted the episode where you told us about park runs. What are park runs? Oh, okay. Well, we'll have to put a link in the show notes because there isn't a lot of time now. But it's um. A 5k run every Saturday morning in lots of parks. There's about 300 of them. Always at 9 o'clock in a... Well... Do you have to yeah. run in all of the parks? Hey, I do... No, not all in one day. I do these park runs as well. Where do you do, do, you? do yours? Where? Yeah, I, I I do them at War Memorial <laughs> Park in Basingstoke. Where's that? In Basingstoke. Oh, okay. <laughs> There are, yeah, <laughs> I do. I've mostly done the Winchester one, but I did the uh, Durham, North Carolina one oh, in the USA well, get you. a couple of weeks ago. Um, yeah, so I'm a bit of a park run tourist now. Mm. But anyway, last last weekend they hit, they passed a hundred thousand people running across the world in park runs. Wow, that, isn't that brilliant? Wow, yeah, that's, that's the amazing. Record so far. Right then, let's get on with it. <laughs> So we've had quite a few people asking us at various points how we go about producing the podcast from a technical setup point of view. Um, And it's changed over the years. Um, The biggest change now is that we're remote. So we thought we'd have a big, uh, a bit of a chat about what we've changed and what stayed the same. So 
Alan, do you want to start? Yes, I'll start. As you were there at the beginning. Yes, first the earth cooled, then the dinosaurs came. We uh, should have some boo. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't quite that And then he again. said, let there be the Ubuntu podcast. <laughs> and yes. there was. Uh, so uh, originally when we, we started seven or so years ago, we started recording in person every other Sunday for the whole day. That's how long it took us because we were terrible people. Uh, and we did it in various <laughs> locations, including in a field uh, near a pub. Um, with a handheld recording device because that's the only place that we could get together at the time. Um, we used to record the audio and then edit out all of the ums and ahs. We were really, really particular about this. And you could, you know, when you're looking at the waveform in um, Audacity, you could see a particular person's um and you'd edit that out and another um and you'd edit that out and it would take ages and we would be very particular about it. And if we made a mistake during the recording, we would stop and restart the sentence and that made more editing and so we recorded on a on a zoom a handheld recorder and over time we over the first series and uh, season and, and beyond we bought more equipment uh, and it the, the equipment got slightly more impressive over time although most of it was second hand or not especially expensive equipment it wasn't like professional recording studio equipment most of it there was a couple of bits that were a couple of decent studio mics but um, and we, we bought a, a mixer. I think Tony bought a gigantic mixer and a compressor to try and improve the audio quality. Uh, we did some phone interviews in the early days and we used a real analog phone uh, rather than using Skype. We actually he had plugged... to buy one specially. <laughs> yeah, and we, yes, he actually had, I remember seeing him standing there with a white been... handset. Because they don't have proper sockets in them or something anymore. Right. Yeah, because you had to daisy chain out through the phone and a trailer cable across uh, your lounge into the phone socket. Yeah. And it, it was all really complicated in order to route all the audio so that we could all hear the person calling in and we could talk to them and they could hear us. And it was, it was, it was quite hard work in those early days. So you've yeah. you've discussed um, how long it took and the technology and what you used to do. But how did you actually get started? How did the group of you come together and decide to make a podcast? Uh, I basically emailed a few people and said, hey, do you want to do a podcast? And why did you want <laughs> that to do was, that? That was, that was it. We, I emailed uh, Simon, uh, Tony, and uh, Laura, and Davey, and we decided to do a podcast. We did loads and loads and loads and loads of planning, and eventually we recorded something, and then we put it out, and it's you know moved on from there so mm. that that was all recorded we never we never did that live so laura then we moved on to doing it live didn't we yeah so we got fed up with all the editing partly <laughs> um <laughs> also simon who did the editing left <laughs> yeah nobody else could be bothered <laughs> um and mark is that about the time you joined the show yes um so yeah, we decided we were going to... For, we did a couple of sessions where we did it as live, where you just had to keep going if you made a mistake. Um, so that obviously changed the style and things. Um, one of the things was that we had to play in the stings live because otherwise we'd have to go back and edit. And the main thing was we didn't want to be editing. Um, so whenever we make changes now, that's our really, really our priority is that we make things as simple as possible to actually produce. Um, so we made the stings longer so that we had breathing, breathing time between the segments because we wouldn't have be able to stop. Um, and we, yeah, we just found that there was a lot more buzz about it. It was like doing the live show at Og Camp almost, except it was just in a living room with no audience. Um, yeah. but we'd have the IRC chat on and, um, we get feedback as we went along. Um, it was a lot more chatty because we were. It was a different style. Um, and you know, if you made a mistake or you overspoke somebody, then you just carried on and dealt with it. Um, and we left all the mistakes in. Um, <laughs> we did try, as you might have noticed, we did try um, a Google Hangout video broadcast for a while. Um, we just slung a webcam over a curtain rail, uh, but apparently no one wanted to see us, so we stopped doing that. <laughs> Yeah, it was a few people who watched, and it was just such a faff to set it up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we didn't there's, do there's only so much joy to be had in the back of Tony's head. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think Tony was anti it mostly because you could see his shiny <laughs> dome. His on the yeah. <laughs> yeah. But also, it's like all we're doing was sitting there talking into microphones. Eating cake. Well, that's all a and newsreader does. <laughs> you watch well, them. That's true. But yeah, yeah they're, they're a lot more pretty than us. So yeah, we decided not that's to do it. that. That's it. Faces for radio. Yeah. And then uh, we changed things again for the last couple of seasons. 
didn't we, Mark? Yeah, so we we um, we moved to using Skype for phone interviews, um, partly for the, to reduce physical equipment and partly because it became possible with better internet connections. Um, <laughs> to our house. Yeah. Um, so we would, the way that we'd normally do that is we'd record it just before the show um, and then we'd play it out into the live show um, which meant that we had time to have a, a break for a cup of tea during the show, which is nice because talking for an hour solidly is quite hard work. Um, Not just a cup we, of tea, though. Cake, cake. as well. Yes. Always cake. Yes. Yeah, you see, so as a um, long-time listener of the show, I'm familiar <laughs> with your references to cake. Do you Do you miss getting together and actually having a cup of tea and a slice of cake? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. I still have a cup of tea and a slice of cake with every show, by the way. I have a glass it's of a bit wine. Different, though. Because I don't have to drive to Nora's house anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I just but, yes. got some biscuits. So um yeah, at, at the the point I think the by the the beginning of, of um of the last season, Tony had still been the only one who'd actually driven the desk for a recording session. So we started learning his ways throughout the last year. Um and I think that the we we sort of had the hang of it yeah. um, in terms of what we needed to do. But when he went away, we discovered that, in fact, um, we while we were able to to do it, if everything went well, if something didn't go so well, we didn't really know what we were doing or how to fix anything. Uh, so you, this led to a... Uh, uh, w- also, some of our equipment was quite old at this point. So this led to a, a gradual and then suddenly not so gradual decline in quality of uh, of some of the episodes towards the end of last year. Um, yeah. And I was which, pulling yeah, our hair out trying to fix things, like, yeah. you know, a dodgy yeah. connector on a on a compressor that we just couldn't fathom that it was the connector. And, <laughs> and at one yeah. point, I think I did a two-man show, me and Poppy one week, and then there was me and uh, Mark another week, and then each one we ended up with either one microphone between the two of us, or, or yeah. it was just, it wasn't good. No. Um another thing that, that happened among, around among this time was we went the intimate sessions. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> they were. <laughs> oh yes. Um yeah, the, around this time we also changed from uh, from doing a sixty minute show to doing two thirty minute shows. Before we would do one sixty minute show every fortnight, then we changed to doing two thirty minute shows every week, which we uh we hoped gave a more sort of consistent uh, release schedule and kept people interested but if people didn't want that then they could just wait two weeks and download both and listen together you won't believe the confusion that caused with seemingly intelligent people <laughs> and also <laughs> confusion and also non-intelligent people like us being able to say tomorrow <laughs> or yesterday oh hang on no i mean next week to- no last time week, just became wibbly wobbly it was very yes. wibbly wobbly yes yes so yeah all changed this year we're now not together yes mm. so we all do this remote in our own house uh which means that none of us have to drive anywhere which is quite yeah. good for for lots of reasons you know it's good for the environment yes. for the hippies mm-hmm. um but also uh it means you know when you finish you just walk away from the computer and, and go to bed and go to bed and you don't have my to case, like, edit the show tear down all the equipment yeah. you don't you don't have to like put all that equipment away or drive home or yeah you know whatever um, yeah. So we do still have some equipment. Yes. Yes. We, M- Laura and I both have a little mixer plugged into our laptops with um, our um, our microphones, which we used for the the um, what's the word for non remote <laughs> in person setup. Um, but yeah, yeah. Now we just do it plugged into our our own devices. Yes. Um, and we we're talking to each other over Mumble. Mm. But we're not recording over Mumble for yes. reasons. We had we had we had some um, we did some tests and um, I actually I got some advice from Joe Ressington. I bundled into the Mintcast Mumble server and uh, started quizzing them how they do it. And Joe Ressington was giving me lots of advice about Mumble and suggested not to record the actual Mumble stream, uh, but instead locally record each person. So we do that. And it, yeah, yeah, I mean, we found that was a problem when we did even just talking over mumble you get a lot of likes sometimes mm. yeah so we found an app called audio recorder which has so a very how are you cool feature the where local audios are 
Yeah. Yes. Yes. We sorry. Yeah, we didn't actually say we said what we didn't do. We didn't uh, say what we did do. We each record locally and then stick it together. So the way that we do that no, is with an app Mark's called Audio Recorder. <laughs> so yeah, we yeah, until you Mark set comes a back, time which uh, you start record. recording. Oh, he's so back. Oh, fuck gone. <laughs> Why is it he's when we're talking again. about mumble, <laughs> mumble messes up? So we we found Audio Recorder. Which so is, shall I <laughs> go on, go on, Mark? <laughs> Start again from audio recorder. Shall I talk about audio recorder? Yes, I think you should. <laughs> Let's just keep going and hold. Right, so yes, notices. we 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 each run audio recorder locally, um, and that has a feature which lets you set the time you want to start it to recording. So we use NTP to sync up our clocks over the network, um, and then that means that they all start recording at exactly the same time. So then everyone sends their files to me. I load them into Audacity, and they're perfectly synced up. And then I just do a bit of processing to make us all sound a bit better um, and still do as little editing as possible. Yep. And how do we get the files to you? In Dropbox. Um, uh, I'm sure it's, I'm sure it's uh, some free software solution, right? <laughs> like uh, OwnCloud. Yeah. yeah. No. We just wanted something easy. This is, this is the, yeah, we should, yeah. yeah. It well, was easy. You, know, you could have used my own cloud, guys. I, d- I did offer. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But we all had Dropbox. Um, after, after, we've, after we've edited... Yeah. Um, after we've edited them together, we've got some uh, some shell scripts, which Tony wrote years and years ago to generate the compressed files, which also add tags and stuff. Um, we're still using uh, the massive clock. Stuart's massive clock. Stuart's massive clock. It was um, a good was job by, by my microphone was language. muted then, because I just snorted ridiculously <laughs> loudly. <laughs> <laughs> it never grows old, does it? No, it doesn't. Yeah, it's it's a cracking little thing though, because we all just have a web browser open, pointing yeah. to us a URL, and we all see the same time, which we will not give up, out, and then we just um, tap it or click it to nudge it onto the next segment, and it gives us an idea of when we're going to overrun. So that's why the show is always around thirty yeah. minutes long, because we try and stick to the timing, you know, the clock that tells us when to shut up. Yeah. Yes. We also and yeah, it's great because because one of us presses it and then it changes for everybody else. Yes. So we also have a fourth presenter computer connected in three Mumble uh, with her own AR, AR audio recorder. Yes, <laughs> she sounds. In the she sounds like this. Hello, Samantha. Oh, Samantha. Um, yes, unfortunately, she doesn't have a microphone, so. You you she only ever speak. hear the stings. Oh, yeah. It's like the it's like the good old function. days of Radio One with the one that doesn't speak. Don't know what you're well, talking. Well, the about. older days of Radio Four. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, so yeah, that's that's how we do it now. Mumble audio recorder, Dropbox the files, Audacity, and then we shove the files up onto the server and create a blog post, and we can turn that around a lot faster. Uh, yeah these days which is good yeah yeah so we're still ironing out some creases as you may have noticed <laughs> um we're gonna i don't know mumble and a bit of lag um we haven't tried going live yet though we do record as if we are live um we just keep going um as you've we noticed <laughs> <laughs> we we've not done any <laughs> remote interviews yet um which we would like to do um, but we also don't want to make it hassle for the remote interviewee, so we need to work this out really. Right, because some people just don't have mumble or don't have yeah. don't have the inclination to yeah. uh, record locally. And some of the people we've interviewed, we've just done it over a phone line. So you know, we yeah. just get them to phone in. In the past, like you know, when you phone someone like you know, Mark Shuttleworth and he's in a hotel somewhere random in the world, you, there's no way you can guarantee that he's got the infrastructure to record locally properly you know it's, yeah. it might just be his mobile phone that you're calling um and that you know it's not especially true of mark that's like mm. everyone most people call from their hallway and shut a door to make sure the kids don't come in and stuff so we want to make yeah. it as frictionless as possible for them but we yeah we probably will do some more interviews very soon we'll, yeah we'll come up with something yep. yeah uh, and we have uh martin joined us uh into the fold mm. um and if you got met basically a similar sort of setup, Martin? Exactly the same. I'm running Ubuntu Mate rather than stock Ubuntu, um, but all of the same tools. But 
a rather more antiquated set of audio equipment that I dug out the loft a few weeks ago. Excellent. I always think when you talk about your antiquated equipment, I always think you're, you know, you've got a baker like uh, <laughs> microphone and well, you're wearing a tuxedo, so a big, Joe, dicky, dicky bow, Joe Ressington, and you're in black and white. Joe Ressington contacted me and said, what have you done to your audio? It's improved a tenfold or, or words to that effect. And I said, oh, I went in the loft and I pulled out an old microphone and stuff from when I was, you know, in a band and what have you. And he said, oh, are you a musician? And I explained, not anymore. And we got into this whole protracted conversation about you know what i used to do and what he does now and i've sent him some of my music and it, it uh, and scarily it is from 20 years ago so this is you know old equipment that's 20 years old that i've pulled out the loft nice cool so if any of you have any further questions or comments uh, or suggestions uh then let us know drop us an email to show at ubuntu podcast.org <laughs> And now it's time for some command line love. <laughs> and this week's command line love is time read. That sounds exciting. Yeah. <laughs> what is it? So have you ever wanted to time something? A simple stopwatch. Yes. Can you not just use your nope. phone? Carry on. Uh, you've never wanted to time something. Um, nope. Oh, okay. So uh, every so often I want to like yeah, but wh- time, well, time you know, a thing, something. Um, and you yeah, know, just want to know how long something took. Uh, <laughs> You've been that's... beautifully vague about this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I uh, think what this means <laughs> is that Alan doesn't have a use case. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. So the most recent example uh, was the other day, and I wanted to time. Uh, no, no, I don't. <laughs> 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 but say you did what would this command do for you so, so the the essential thing you need to know about this command uh you type time space read now the time command allows you to time the runtime of another command right so doing time read just means it times how long the system is waiting for you to do something and so if you just do time read and then press enter it just sits there and does nothing it doesn't give you any output it doesn't do anything it's just sat there waiting for me it doesn't you run you press Control d when whatever the thing is that you're timing has finished and at that point it tells you how long that thing took that doesn't sound terribly clever i just get an error when i try and run it uh what shell are you using um fish yeah that's why Use a proper shell. Use bash. So it, it, oh, okay. you may need to change your shell <laughs> and loads of other things to use this amazing <laughs> Oh, good. This is convenient. And as a stopwatch, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take into account your reaction time as well. It's not just timing to the command running or something, is it? Well, most stopwatches, you know, there's the time it takes for you to press the stop button. I don't think that's unreasonable. That it's the time it takes you to press control D. I mean, but you could do that with your phone. Uh, what if your phone doesn't have a stopwatch feature? Okay, does the Ubuntu phone have a stopwatch yeah, feature? No. <laughs> All right, then. That it there. does, because it has a bash shell. You can run time read. <laughs> yes! <laughs> it ships with bash out of the box. So you open a terminal. Uh, now so we you, have no, a use actually, case. You have to install the terminal from the app store and then open the terminal, type in your passcode, because it's a secure app, and then type time space read and then press enter. Um. <laughs> How do you do Control D on a Ubuntu phone? There's a little overlay keyboard that's got a Control D in it. We think <laughs> of everything, my friend. Oh, good. So yeah, that's command line love. <laughs> Alex emailed in to plug his startup in response to our segment about Linux hardware last week. Uh, in response to section in Season 8, Episode 6 about buying Linux computers, I hope it's okay if I send in a shameless plug for Simplex Computers. This is a startup business which I launched in January that sells computers exclusively running Ubuntu. You may remember that I tweeted you. Uh, the ethos behind the business is to provide polished and high-quality systems which new users, as well as seasoned Linux folks, 
can pick up and use. I did this because in the past I wanted such a system to buy myself, but I didn't really see anything on the existing market that ticked all the boxes. Although small and only shipping within the UK at the moment, I hope you guys like the idea. I plan to donate a percentage of the profits made on the machines back to the Ubuntu project. Winner. What a great idea. Yeah, yeah thank you. Cool. Uh, thank you, Alex. Yeah. We'll put a link uh, to Simplex Computers in the uh, the show notes, but I'm sure you know if you Google for Simplex Computers, you'll find something. It's it's great having like small independent companies who are who are you know shipping computers running Linux. You know that's what we talked about in uh, episode six. It's great to have more choice. Uh, I agree with that. It is good to have more choice, particularly in the UK. That's terrific. Yeah. Hmm. Mm. Esteban left a comment on our website. As a user of Google Task, I took note of Martin's comments about the possibility of Google killing Google Task. As a previous user of Google Notebook and Google Reader, which were also killed by Google, I had a feeling that Google Task might be facing the same fate. Mm. Yes, right I'd just like Keep to qualify my data. predictions with the fact that I am always wrong. Um, but, <laughs> but Welcome I, to the show. Yeah, but I do, I do <laughs> think that You're Google Task... You're in just right. Yeah, I do think that Google Task is on, uh, is on thin ice. Uh, even so, I have a track history of being wrong about everything. Mm. Well, we shall see. We shall see. Um, yeah, indeed. Um, Sam emailed in about the future changes in Unity. I've never seen Ubuntu in better shape than at present in the current 15.04 Beta 2. The refinement of hand and handy features of Unity, together with System D, the fantastic Ubuntu Software Center, and the easy installation of proprietary drivers and codecs, make Ubuntu a truly formidable contender on the desktop. But the decision makers of successful technologies have a bad habit of changing just for the sake of change. Gnome threw out their successful Gnome 2.x paradigm, Windows axed the beloved Windows 7 interface, and now I fear Ubuntu might be doing the same with the transition from Unity 7 to Unity 8. I'm worried that we will all lose. One, easy, base, easy GUI-based configurability. I can slightly customise Ubuntu with the Ubuntu tweak tool. I suspect that pretty much none of the detailed minor settings will be configurable in Unity 8, and that will be a real shame. They say Unity 8 can be customised by changing QML files, but I don't relish it turning into the next GNOME shell with extensions or hacks that require manual code tweaks and invariably break from one version to the next. 2. Compiz. I actually don't like glitz and glamour, but I do appreciate some of the features provided by Compiz, such as Windows stamping and Expose-style window spread. Compiz obviously won't exist in Unity 8, which will also be a loss. 3. Indicators. I depend on some indicators, such as Indicator Multiload, the Sound Switcher Indicator, as well as apps that add their own little system tray indicator. I hope none of this functionality gets crippled or removed altogether in Unity 8. So in summary, Ubuntu, please don't suicide on upgrade to Unity 8. You are currently the most popular desktop Linux distro, and for good reason. Don't change what users already like, and please keep bringing us the same desktop refinement, usability, configurability, and overall quality that we've come to enjoy over the years. Yeah, it's an interesting mail, actually. Uh, I... I um... Yes. I don't think Unity 7 is going away anytime soon, even though you know we will transition to Unity 8 at some point. Um, and I, I had a chat with one of the Unity 8 developers earlier on today about configurability and how they're looking to add configurability options into Unity 8. They're not done yet because you know, Unity 8 itself isn't completely finished yet. Um, so I, I wouldn't be too worried. Um, Mark Shuttleworth has also spoken publicly that Unity 8 won't become the default until it's ready. Until you know, he he acknowledged that there was a bit of a mistake uh, making Unity the default uh, when it was initially done, um, and he's not going to make that same mistake with Unity Eight. So we will we will wait and see, and you know, cool. provide your feedback to us all the time with you know what you like, what you don't like, and yeah, we'll pass that on. And finally, Torin emailed in about F Droid. It's great to have Laura back. I love her laugh. And Martin Wimpress is a great addition to the podcast. And Popey is the ideal host. Sorry, Mark. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, do you host it? <laughs> yes, I do. Yes. Uh, after hearing you guys talk about Android and it moving further away from the open source world, I thought I'd add my two cents. As a huge advocate of FOSS, I recently decided to reset my Android phone to factory defaults and then not sign into Google account on initial setup, and instead only use F-Droid apps. This way, I don't even need to use a Google account. 
I get my fine. I'd be happy to eventually jump to an Ubuntu phone. It'd be great if I had an F-Droid equivalent. Yeah, I've seen uh, a few friends who've um, installed, uh, had um, Android devices and then just eschewed all of the uh, Google stuff, like not actually used any of the Google uh, play services or, or yeah. Um, apps. Yeah, I've I've experimented this by installing Cyanogen Mod on my old phone, but not installing uh, the Google Apps package on the top. So you you just have you know the base Cyanogen Mod and then installing F Droid, and you can get a surprisingly long way to um, you know a, a feature full system um, without all that much compromise. Um, so. It can be done, and if you are prepared to make a few compromises along the way, it's um it's a really usable system. Also, so, what is F Droid? It's like um, it's like an app store, but it's only open source applications for for Android. Okay. So you know that anything you install, there's some really good ones in software. there as well. Yeah, and and a lot of what's in F Droid is also available from the Google Play Store in most cases. But um, there's a few in F Droid that you can't get in Google Play services because their terms and conditions don't allow them to be listed anymore. Okay. Mm. Well, thanks for all your feedback, and uh, if you have any for us, you can send it to show at ubuntu podcast dot org. <laughs> That's all for episode eight. We'll be back uh, next week. Uh, when's that going to be? Oh, right. Samantha, Naughty. Samantha's <laughs> dropped the gun there. <laughs> she has just a bit. <laughs> Golly. It's so loud as well. Things go wrong sometimes. Um, so That's when's the next? Uh, 5th of May, I think it is. We'll be back yeah. then for more news, comment, discussion. Cool. Get in touch. Send us your feedback. Send us news. Interesting command line loves. And we'll see you then. Yeah. Bye. Thanks for listening. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. Are we going to stop recording? <laughs>